We're live, I think. Are we uh, are we good to go? Good to We're live. Go. All right. And you're live. Hey guys, uh, it's great to have you. Uh, I was just talking to Alex, who's setting everything up for us, and she reminded me that this was, I think, the fifth or sixth of our brand live podcast that we have done, and uh, we like them. It's really kind of a fun format. Hope you guys like it too. Tony is uh, running a little late. I'm, I'm going to tell you he's out in the vineyard doing something really important, but probably not. He's probably having a beer somewhere and, and uh, waiting for me to... to uh... Oh, there he is. Oh, the talent I, is late. I hope, <laughs> I, hope, I hope you had a beer. I, I had champagne. <laughs> champagne. Well, there you go. I apologize now. Philosophical discussions go a lot longer do. than... Factual. I'm paying so. you. I'm paying you far too much. I'm having a bad wiser. Exactly. And you're having solos. That's I am not, not, that's not right. no solos. No, no. Trust me. I wish it was. So, um, hi everybody. This is Tony. He's our so. infamous winemaker, extraordinaire. Um, so, Tony, what I'm going to do is we have some we have some new folks in the group okay. uh, today, and so I'm going to give them a little kind of quickie bullet point background um, on how we came to be. And then, uh, and then we'll jump into t- kind of talking about the wines sure. that we have today and, and so forth. So, um, for those of you who are new to us, uh, some of you have been with us before, so you probably heard, uh, heard this before, but, um, I'll try to make it, um, I'll try to make it prompt. So I had the great fortune of growing up here in St. Helena. My family moved here in 1964 when I was a wee one years old. So I'm a K through 12 St. Helena public school kid. Uh, have seen Napa go through some enormous changes, obviously, as you can imagine. Um, the Napa Valley of the 1960s and 70s, even, even into the 80s, <clears throat> very different than uh, the Napa Valley of today. And just had one of these really fortunate um, uh, things of being at the right place at the right time. So I grew up around the dinner tables of many of the families who migrated into Napa Valley, picked up the bones of this industry that had been scattered about by Prohibition. Um, back in 1919 uh, and basically laid dormant until really the mid 70s to the late 70s we really started to see things change in Napa so um, my father had bought a piece of property in 1976 that he was going to build a home on being the practical guy that he was he wanted uh, some landscaping that would pay for itself and so cash crop was sort of in his sights he had no great aspirations of being in the wine business and in the mid to late 70s, you know, there were only a handful of people coming here uh, with um, great visions of, of owning and building wine companies and so forth. So my dad wasn't really part of that set. He had been here earlier. He was a real estate developer. Um, but he bought this really cool piece of property. And um, he, wanted, he wanted this landscaping that would pay for itself. So he planted Zinfandel on the hillside of this uh, little, little site that's about two miles north of the town of St. Helena. And we farmed it uh, for a number of years. It became kind of the core of Camus' Zinfandel program for a number of years through the late 70s into the 80s. Then my father passed away in 1990. I picked up the management of the vineyard for my mom that year. And the next year, 91, we got hit with phylloxera. So we had to pull that vineyard out and replant it. And in doing so, um, my mom wasn't sure she wanted to, to keep the property. In fact, she, she really wanted to sell it. And I convinced her not to, that she should um, replant it to Cabernet and start a little brand off of this little hillside, four-acre hillside vineyard. And um, long story short, that's exactly what we did. We replanted to Cabernet. And one of the tasks that I had in the process of trying to convince my mom that I wasn't completely out of my mind, um, I was 26 at the time and actually was out of my mind, but... um, she knew that and I didn't. <laughs> anyway, um, she wanted she wanted some proof of concept. Uh, I hadn't gone to uh, school for winemaking or viticulture and she knew that I was um, full of BS and so she wanted uh, some way to um, cut through the nonsense and and see if actually this crazy idea that I'd come up with had any had any weight. So um, I went to UC Davis and I got Dr. Cleaver, the Dean of Viticulture, to come out and give us a site evaluation just to kind of pressure test my ideas on whether this little site could be a great Cabernet site or not. And he thought, he thought yes, that it could be, that, it, that in, in his words, he thought it was, um, had the potential to be one of the best Cabernet sites in Napa Valley, which was sort of cool confirmation of my, of my base idea. 
But in that conversation, um, we talked a lot about why that site was so special and magical. And one of the things that he said was, you know, Jeff, Napa Valley is more or less shaped like an hourglass, and your hillside vineyard defines the pinch or the narrow crossing. And that's where the name came from. And later we found out that there were some thermal dynamics of that that made that site really special, and we can talk about that later. But um, we replanted the Cabernet. We got um, Bob Foley early on as the original uh, consulting winemaker and lightning in a bottle. We got a great vineyard, great winemaker, good branding, and off it went. And the timing was fantastic. We kind of coattail rode that group of original eight wineries that set up the template for the cult wine phenomenon. So we jumped that train and rode it pretty hard. We were making five to 700 cases of wine a year, um, selling it out in February. And um, by uh, a couple of years after um, doing that for a while, we decided we wanted to do something else. We wanted to grow our business. We had 3,000 people on a wait list that we could not sell wine to. So we started looking around for another vineyard. And by 2006, we had acquired the Blue Line Estate Vineyard, uh, which is close to the Calistoga um, in, in the Dutch Henry Canyon area. It's a beautiful, very magical little vineyard. Um, there we have all five red Bordeaux varietals planted. We built a winery so that we could now take both estates or both uh, vineyards and uh, keep them underneath the estate nomenclature. So everything that we do, with the exception of HG3, is all estate fruit. Um, we do... Um, so think of Hourglass as the banner label with uh, Hourglass Estate, Blue Line Estate as the subdividing um, uh, vineyard designates underneath the master label. Today we're going to be tasting two wines from the Blue Line Estate, uh, Sauvignon Blanc and the HG3. Um, and that, I think that maybe is a, a good sort of recap of <clears throat> kind of where we are. We've, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, most Tony. important. The most important thing is that um, in 2012 we brought Tony Biaggi in to take over full-time wine making for Bob Foley. So these are wines that Tony has made, and Tony has done an amazing job of taking kind of the template that Bob set and evolving that and refining it and developing it into sort of the next phase uh, of our glass. And I'm really excited about the evolution of our wine making. And we can talk a little bit about um, that as we as we move into these wines. Um, Alex, would you like me to? Should we take any questions right now? Um, I think everyone's excited to kind of just start. The just jump in. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's go ahead and jump in. And I'm, I think I'm going to turn over to Tony a little bit here. Just dive in. Let's get in there. <laughs> so, uh, I'm a little less loquacious than Jeff. So. Um, um, you know. <laughs> it's a lie. A little less it's rambling. A, it's, a, it's a lie. It's a lie. No, I, lo I love the sound of my own voice too. So I'm a winemaker, don't we all? So uh, first wine is a Sauvignon Blanc. You know, Jeffs had said that HG3 is one of the only wines that's not estate driven. There are estate grapes in there. The Sauvignon Blanc also is long term contracts under vineyards that our vineyard manager farms. It's not on the property. So if anybody asks, it's not at Blue Line. It's not at Hourglass Estate. But yet our vineyard manager farms it. So. We have a long-term contract there, and they farm it to our specifics. So and it, is does, a it does qualify as an as estate, estate grow. wine. Yeah. yeah. So to be an estate wine, you have to own your own winery, you have to own your own vineyards, or have a long-term lease yeah. on those vineyards, exactly. just, which is what we do. When someone asks today, well, where do you grow Sauvignon Blanc at Blue Line? We don't. So just, just so you know, and I want to be straight up with you guys on that. But yet, Sauvignon Blanc to me in Napa Valley is sort of the mirror of Cabernet. Uh, Chardonnay does grow well here in pockets. Uh, I think Sauvignon Blanc grows well where Cabernet grows since it's his mother. So, you know, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc, or sorry, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc got together, made Cabernet. Just how it happened. It was crazy. Crazy night, you know? We've all been there, right? Crazy nights. You think, you think they were drunk? Yeah, I think they might have been. They might have been. So you have the bushiness in Cabernet. Well, of, but what were they drinking? I think they were tequila. Probably Beaujolais. That's what happens. <laughs> Everybody drinks Beaujolais when you're crazy. So, um, um, Sauvignon Blanc to me is very, you know, I love it. I, I started my career at Duckhorn, and so Duckhorn Sauvignon Blanc was always very close to my heart. And then subsequently going to Neil Family Vineyards or even Plump Jack and Cade, I've always made Sauvignon Blanc. So when Jeff said, I want to make white wine, we almost said in the same time, it's like, remember the old Zoolander movie, you know, it's, 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 it's Mochaccino Frappuccino. And we said Sauvignon Blanc at the same time. <laughs> it came out of our mouths and we danced, we, we danced around, we knew what we were going to do. 
And Sauvignon Blanc is what we wanted to do. and Especially in the northern part. It of the is, body, absolutely. It's warmer in the I mean, northern part. Some of the best Sauvignon Blancs come from the northern part, whether yeah. you have Araujo or you have uh, Frediani or Toffinelli. Those vineyards are just, just magical for Sauvignon Blanc. This comes from Larkmead, a little bit of Verosa. This is some old vines in here, up to 50 years old. Very much a touch of wood. We only use 20% new wood. The balance is stainless steel drum, um, old barrels, and then tank, all native yeast fermented. So this year we're kind of excited. We found uh, Tom Gamble gave us a ton of so uh, Semillon, which I'm very excited to play with. So, I mean, I love Sauvignon Blanc. I think this wine's very crisp, very clean, but the acidity, we're very much um, a fiends for acidity, whether it be white wine throughout the whole portfolio. Um, I love ripeness, but I love acidity. I love the dichotomy between the two. You know, I love you know sweet and sour. I think anybody does. It's why Chinese food's so good, right? Yeah. You know, what I mean, or ketchup. And I think you know, this is so. this may um, speak a little bit to why we brought Tony on board in 2012. We have um, gone through sort of the full spectrum of stylistic uh, interpretations um, with the Hourglass label. I, I don't think we ever you could ever qualify us as completely traditionalist, but. We picked up the spectrum, you know, somewhere uh, left of center in terms of ripeness. Uh, Bob Foley was one of the uh, champions and architects of, of higher pH winemaking, so we started pushing the needle a little bit out into the ripeness side of things, and we followed that needle kind of all the way out to its logical extension um, by 2009. And in understanding and having slid across that entire spectrum, we had a pretty good idea after we got out there that we didn't want to stay there, that we really wanted to be just a bit right of center in terms of um, a style. And so to do that, what we wanted to do was bring back um, tensional energy into the wine. So it's either, you can achieve that either through acidity or through minerality. And in, in our case, we can do that sometimes with both. Um, but Tony and I talked for probably three months before we brought Tony on board about sort of how we would find the Holy Grail and where we would kind of land Hourglass stylistically on this full spectrum. And I'm really, really proud of what Tony has been able to do to, to kind of dial back the phenolic mass, give us more expression of minerality, more expression of acidity. So there's this sort of tensional pull or tensional edge against the richness. We love richness, but we want it wound against something so there's a, more of a dynamic mouthfeel. You know, I guess, I, I mean, I don't think I wound back the phenolics as much as I wound back the alcohol. Um, I think it's a matter of, I can still get the phenolic mass without the alcohol. It, it, it's just a game. You're, you're on top of your wines. And it really was a, it really was a convergence of two people with two like minds. I mean, I had crafted the wines of Plump Jack for 10 years, being the winemaker at Plump Jack and Cade. And, you know, Jeff had Hourglass, and I saw the properties, and... As a 40-year-old person in the wine business, I wanted to work for a singular owner who had a vision. I wanted to work for someone who had their own vineyards, their own winery, and um, you know, craft wines that we both wanted to drink in the yeah. end of every day. I mean, we both understood where we wanted to go. I'm a Bordeaux drinker. I'm a Burgundy drinker. I'm a, I'm a Rhone drinker, Barolo drinker. Um, you know, you you're can't. Just a, you're just a drinker. I, well, sometimes. <laughs> and I'm not. I'm not shy. I just put it that way. So. But uh, maybe not white Rhone wine drinker. Other than that, I love everything else. But, but the reality you of it. You like acid. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just so. So, a question? Yeah, a couple questions actually. Um, how long is the Sauvignon Blanc on its lees? Um, John Leonard from Chicago says it's very creamy, um, but it balances this very bright acidity that you're talking about. Uh, good question. We, we, so, so, repeat the question. So, so we, that, that, um, how long is it on its lees? And it's very creamy, they thought. And I, and, I agree. And, but, but crisp. But it's crisp, I and mean, it's really the acidity. You know, we try to get the grapes with, with a ton of acidity. We try to pick within the three two, three three pH, with about eight eight grams or nine grams of acidity. I know that's like way over most of your heads. Well, probably not. It's over my uh, head. Yeah, it is. It's 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 over my head too. So I mean, I'm a lover, not a fighter, Jeff. So um, the, the reality of it is. So least stirring, but least stirring. You know, I used to be an aggressive least stir, and I'm a big fan of white Burgundy, and so the new people of Merceau. Um, you know, Fiche, Rouleau, I mean, Rouleau's old new, um, all these, Dan Vincent Dancer, they don't lee stir anymore. And I've talked to a lot of people about it, so we've cut our lee stirring way back. Now, the wine sits on its lees almost till February before we rack it off and we, we cold stabilize it and heat stabilize it before bottling. This wine has no ML, so we have to stabilize it or it will, it will go off in the bottle. So, um, but because of that, I've just cut way back on my lee stirring. I used to do it once a week, now I don't even do it once a month. 
So, but yet, I think sitting on the leaves and getting some fatness from that really, really helps. The musque has a, a oiliness naturally. This is a good chunk of musque in there that gives you some oiliness that might be masquerading as fatness from the leaves. So. And, and a little bit of new oak fermentation. It is, and that gives you some, yeah, absolutely, it gives you some of the new new fatness as well. But. So you do, Tony, you do a stainless steel fermentation, a neutral wood fermentation, and um, a new wood fermentation. Yes, absolutely. And we also have cigars, so the long, narrow barrels. I'm a big fan of DDA Dagano, and he uses them as well so we a use more surface area longer surface area much more leaves laid down not they're not thicker leaves it's because the longer you are right. the thinner the leaves surface but it's more yeah. exposed more so exposed, you're more, right. more exposed so that might be coming into play as well so. and so tony how what percentage of um of the total blend would be say new wood versus about 20 percent we, we had talked about that a little earlier but 20 percent new oak i tend to use burgundy barrels instead of bordeaux barrels i'll do use some i like thicker stave barrels for sauvignon blanc so, I, I, so that, gives you, that helps give you a little creamy mid palate, yeah. And then you know, so. obviously, your your early picks give you that kind of. Uh, it's, well, I think this, these vineyards give us acidity. Yeah, just just they just do, which so. is really cool. Yes. And then, how is the decision made to use or not natural yeast? So natural yeast or not, and how is the decision good, it, it, come to you? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think <laughs> I, I look at lots of what, what what will finish. Um, I don't want to not. I want to let something go natural that will finish. I don't want to have to inoculate it halfway through, knowing that it won't. Uh, I know some people believe the beginning of nat native yeast fermentation, you get some very interesting aromatics, and that's true. But you can also get some very bad things. I'm I'm willing to go the whole way. So uh, I tend to look at the sugar levels, um, nutrient levels. It's a decision. I mean, it's a business too, and we have. It's an art. It's also a business, and you have to understand. If 500 cases of wine go bad, you know, you guys all can think about it out there. You all do. You all have your own job. Think about your boss getting mad at you for screwing up 500 things. Jeffy doesn't um, like. Jeff, Jeff, <laughs> Jeffy's not happy. And the reality is, I'm not happy as, as an employee of Jeff. I mean, I make the wines, and Jeff gives me a lot of autonomy. But yet, I do work for Hourglass, and 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 so Jeff and I are talking all the day long. 15 is a very hard vintage in general for fermentations. It was a very very nutrient poor year and Jeff and I were on the phone probably every other day talking about it but Jeff also understands that he wants to make some unique one-of-a-kind wines and, and I love white wine native yeast red wines we can all debate about if it's better for native yeast or not I don't think it is and I think are, are, reasons are all of the lots uh, for the 70 block with native yeast we do inoculate a little bit, mm -hmm. it's, but it's predominantly all. If you I get mean, a, if you get a higher sugar, will you, will you inoculate? That absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because you they, don't want to create VA, VA or stuck fermentations, right. which will go to VA. So that, that's why we how we do it. So. And there's a question: Do you guys do batonnage on this? Is there any semillon? Wow, it's funny. We, we uh, we'll have semillon this year. <laughs> um, batonnage not, not in the 15 vintage not yet. in the 15 vintage batonnage is uh, we just talked about that sort of stirring concept and we do it about once every month uh, once every three weeks I used to do it every other week and because of I still think you get the fatness and the oiliness from the yeast what you want is when the yeast autolysize which means they break apart they're, they're, they're dying um, I always think it's, it's kind of funny. Prometheus, the movie, when, when the, the crazy dude at the beginning falls into the water because he's going to die and it just breaks apart. It's kind of what yeast do. And they give you your manoproteins. And the manoproteins are what give you the mouthfeel. Um, we used to think that if you stir them more, you get it up in the air more. But they die on their own and they give you, they give you that on their own. So we stop stirring. So we just don't stir as much. So. Do we have more questions? Not about the Sauvignon Blanc, but we have a few questions that might be good lead-ins for the, the Reds. Okay. Sure. Um, sure. This is from Dazel. He says, you guys were on the early end of the cult wine era. What would you say is the state of cult wine today? I sometimes hear boutique micro winery and cult wine used interchangeably. Yeah, I, I, um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting term. There's some people that shy away from it. I think it is part of the history of Napa, so I'm not terribly shy about talking about it. Um, but I, I might have a slightly different take on what constitutes a cult wine and, and what isn't a cult wine. And so, and I think Tony, we may be we may be on lo in lockstep on this one. So. But yeah. so I we're both wine lovers. I think if you're a wine lover, you, and you a, have to understand what it is. And a, and a wine historian too. Yeah. So um, so I think that I think that the um, the concept of cult wines. Uh, to me, there are eight, and those eight are there for a reason. We actually are not in, I wouldn't put us in that group of eight. So the, that eight would be 
uh, Screaming Eagle, Harlan, Colgan, Bryant, Dalavale, um, Abreu, Grace, and I always forget the eighth. No come to it. it, it I would argue. Of, I would argue the fact even deeper. There's two others. There's there's Synquanon and there's Merkison. Yeah. So okay. Those. But but that's but, that's so, one of your so story those, where you're going. Right. So yeah, those are so. outside of Napa Valley. So I would keep it within that group of eight when you're talking about Napa Valley. And why? So why are there eight in that group? And and the reason is that those wineries were the game changers. They changed um, the way that wine was made. They changed the way that that vineyards were farmed. They changed the way that wines were marketed. Um, and so that group, uh, I, to me, gets the classification of being the cult wines because they were the ones who created the concept, created the category, and so forth. So what does that mean from a winemaking standpoint? Um, I, I think it's the, it's the move into higher pH winemaking. And so those wines, when you tasted those first group of eight versus their competitive set of, of the qualitative leaders that came before them, they were different wines. They were just made differently. They had different mouthfeel. They had different aromatics. Oh, Harlan, did you get Harlan? I may not. Have. Yeah, so Harlan, Harlan would be in there. So there, there's your eight. Um, so Hourglass was not in that group of eight. Uh, that that group started, I would argue, in 1990, maybe 89. Harlan's first vintage was 89. I don't think they no. marketed it. Harlan's first vintage was 91. Yeah, they made an '89, but they yeah. never marketed. They never marketed. Mar no, they, the first yeah, the first one they released was '91. So, so not so early, that early '90s, '91, '92. So Bryant has a '91, '92. Bryant had a '92. '92 is Colgan. '91 was Araujo. '92 is Colgan and Bryant. Grace was '78. So they were all. <laughs> so Grace was the one who kind of so. created the model, and they were all sort of following. They were all following Dick's. Uh, formula, I sold basically. Then I could tell you. I mean, those guys, those wines are. Yeah, they're hard to get. Yeah. I mean, so so small production, hard to get, mailing list only. But for me, what makes them more interesting is the winemaking paradigm shift that they spurred on. So ripeness became the, the, the critical factor to that, and that's where the hang time concept started to you know drift to the more modern side um, of wines that uh, you know were more lush, uh, more black fruits, a little bigger mouthfeel, aromatics, and so forth. So we weren't part of that eight, but we were on the tip of the second wave there were it was us and hundred acre and schrader um later came stuff and plump jack uh oh i would say you guys you were before all those what's that you guys we, were you're 97 i mean we were yeah, before schrader yeah, yeah you, actually you, you, you schrader guys were, was a one you're number nine number nine of the eight no i would be honest I and mean, how hard it was to get oh god i mean you can get that so one. um and we've morphed a bit, you know, so we started as a 500 case brand um, and we fit that classic sort of, you know, culty parameters. Absolutely. Um, and then over time, I never really wanted to be that. I never wanted to be just a 500 case brand. I wanted to do more things. So then when we acquired the Blue Line Estate in 2006, it gave us the ability to sort of break out of that category and start moving beyond. And uh, and that so that's what we that's what we've been doing. We're still really small. Our total production of the state wines is about thirty five hundred cases between the two uh, the two estate vineyards. So we're still really small, but um, we've kind of graduated out of that sort of culty culty zone. Next and question. Start, no, it starts tasting the Merlot. Yeah. Let's do it. Get yeah, down. and I don't think I don't think Merlot would ever find its way into a cult wine. Uh, uh, so definition. It says if you're so. drinking Masetta. Yeah, because we all know that Merlot's crap, so. <laughs> Garbage. <laughs> when, we acquired, when we acquired the Blue Line Estate in, in 2006, it, it was planted with quite a bit of Merlots. It, it, the proximity of that vineyard is right next door to Switchback Ridge, which is great Merlot vineyard, across the street. Uh, uh, Three Palms. D Tony is, a, is an alum of Duckhorn, so he knows that vineyard really well. And then on the. It's dumb. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun little thing. Um, and then on the Selby Creek Aluvo fan, which Blue Line is at the head of, so it's us, and then to the right of us is, um, is Switchback, and then across the street is Three Palms, and then it kind of splays out and into the middle part of the vineyard, and you've got Blair and Monitor Ledge. And I mean, Dan Duckhorn believes, in that that's, that was the backbone of Duckhorn from the 90s. He yeah. loves that area. He bought fruit the whole strip. I mean, I could I just go look at all the vineyards that he bought. Like, really, really different soils than you would they normally are. expect yeah, from cool. Merlot, because Merlot typically is grown in more, you know, sort of clay-based soils. There's virtually no clay anywhere on our property. It's all alluvial gravel soils. It's a, a, a soil profile called Cortina. 
uh, cobbly, gravelly, sandy, mineral rich, nutrient poor, not the type of place that you would normally expect Merlot. It's true. But that's why this is what it is. It makes a very opulent style of Merlot. I mean, mm-hmm. as a winemaker, I mean, working at Duckhorn, I know those vineyards really well. And other than Three Palms, for some three, some reason, Three Palms is very nervy. Uh, but you go See, to Larkney it's, Lane. It's the minerality. Yeah, it is. But, but yet our, our vineyard, for some reason, you know, it, it's almost gets a rifling effect because we're between two mountain peaks. The wind hits it. It comes through, cools it down. But you hit Three Palms and it's just the wind dissipates. And this is much more opulent than even Three Palms is. Three Palms is yeah. incredibly nervy. But if you go down to Larkney Lane... Those wines were the backbone of Duck Horn Estate wines from the 90s, and those wines are very opulent and lush and sort of just very aristocratic in that way. You get some commonalities amongst the Merlots that come from the Selby Creek Alluvial fan. That nerviness that um, that Tony is is talking about is a a constant thread through those. So it's us or Switchback or Three Palms or Blair or Monitor Ledge or Larkmead. All of those um, wines will have a little bit of a nerviness to them. And that's really great because you're in a warmer pocket with an early ripening grape, which is a bit of a challenge. So you get that unctuousness, you get that richness, you need that nerviness, that minerality yeah. that's buzzing on the back mid palate. So we, we kind of refer to this as the blue line buzz. There's some sort of mineral reaction with the salivary protein on the back mid palate. So... The acids aren't particularly high in this, I don't think, Tony. Not, out of all the wines from Blue Line, it's the, it's the lowest. I mean, okay, uh, the highest, because you go reverse, because it's, you know, pH. It's, so it's, it's the lowest, but yet it's the highest. Right, so, so it's, it's, high, like it's probably high, the highest, highest pH, lowest Probably acid. in the 3.8s or 3.9s, where the Cabernet and the Franc is in the 3.7s or 3.8s. So you wouldn't, ex- you wouldn't expect a wine of that pH to have the buzziness. The, the TAs size. are 6 grams, Yeah, is, which is really, it's a really unique sight. I mean, I, I've never seen anything like it. So, so. You, you get that you get that sort of tensional talking um, earlier about sort of stylistically what we want to accomplish with our winemaking here, which is to have the richness, but to have this sort of tensional edge that's pulling at that and lifting it and giving it more dimension. The minerality plays a huge role relative to all of the wines from Blue Line. It's everything. It's it, it's actually terroir. That dirty word. We don't have that in the New World, Tony. We don't. We have no good (laughs) sites. We have no good sites. Except for Tokelon. I want to make all all my wines at Tokelon. We're all homogenous, aren't we? No pressure, you guys, but apparently we're trending in the USA right now, number 48, on all the trending Twitter hashtags. That's That's awesome. Yay, thank you, guys. That's that's what I do. I trend. I'm a trender. (laughs) Can I follow you? Hashtag amazing. (laughs) So, Um, So we have a question from Brittany in LA. She'd like to know, Tony, how has your expertise with Bordeaux varietals influenced the way you make these wines now? That's a great question. How do my expertise with Bordeaux varietals come here? You know, the site drives it. I mean, you're trying to match what you know in your quiver of arrows with what the site gives you. Um, I don't. I think the worst thing a winemaker can do is sort of, you know, mug it, mug the site, I call it, because I'm going to tell you what I can do. Let the site come to you and sort of make the wines as they're coming to you, saying, okay, I'm going to grab an arrow out of my quiver, do this, do that. Because like Jeff was saying, I want Blue Line to still have the minerality, because if you come and walk the soils, the cobbles are everywhere. The dirt is everywhere. It's a very unique site. It's this. It's the reason why I'm working with Jeff. Truthfully, I mean, he he he. he I mean, he'll sell snow to Eskimos, you know. But the, but the point of the matter is, is that um, the site's what sold me. It's, it's it's it's. I think it's one of the top five sites in Napa Valley. I really truly believe that Blue Line is, and I've seen a lot of them working for Plum Jack or Duckhorn, and and and. I think you have to be able to have a quiver that can work to the site. I don't ever want to part my will on the site. Now, there are vintages like 11 that you need to because if not, you're going to lose the vintage. But in most vintages, I want the site to shine through. 13 was a winemaking vintage. 14, what you're tasting some of these 14s right here, it was a little bit of both. They gave me something. I had to give them a little something. It's a great vintage. I like it. I love it. I think it's everybody as good as 13. But, I mean, yeah, that's, that's sort of... I mean, I probably will talk around your aunt, your question, but that's sort of the, the answer. So, <laughs> answered it. So, but well, hold on, hold on. Uh, to answer that a little bit more, the, so the question revolved around, um, around you know, Bordelais, your experience with Bordelais varietals and, and so forth, and Bordelais techniques. What I find interesting about Tony, and one of the reasons that I was very fascinated in working with him, is that Tony is. Um, he's, he's a historian in many respects, sort of a technical historian in, in many ways, in the sense that he has um, thrown himself into winemaking to learn techniques that are both 
very traditional and also very modern. And I hired, I hired Tony because he has one of the most um, uh, kind of deep knowledge of modern phenolics and how modern phenolics work. And that was very fascinating to me in terms of refining our wines. Um, but he also takes this super modern perspective and marries that with more traditional Bordelais techniques. For example, when we were, our, our blending protocols before Tony came on board were to blend right before we bottled. So the first, one of the first things yeah. that Tony came in and said, was, I, I want to employ a different technique. I want to employ more of a traditional Bordeaux technique of early blending. So Tony now blends right after malolactic fermentation. And we, and we do. We still tinker at the end, but it's, I, sure. I always say call it the stew technique. I mean, stew tastes better five days later than it does the day you make it. And yep. I think making wine is the same way. If you're, you know, we make an estate-based blue line. It's not a single vineyard clone derivative. It's not. I think sometimes in California, and I think all of you as wine writers out there would, would agree, I mean, you see every these brands have 19 wines. It's like, oh, clone four, clone six, clone 19, you know you know, Martha's Bottom. You know, what is this? I mean, the, the reality is we're crafting Blue Line Cabernet. And so we have 20 acres there to craft the best Blue Line Cabernet. And so my goal is to make the best Blue Line Cabernet, not to make Clone 7 Blue Line, you know, Ruddy Bottom. You know, it, it's, it's Burgundy. We, ha we have Burgundy on the mine, but yet we're crafting Bordelais wines. Go to Bordeaux, they're crafting all these wines in March. They're, we're putting the blends together, and that's what we're doing. I want Blue Line to be marrying for the next 15 months in barrel before you bottle it because it's getting better and better and better. And, you know, and that's how I look at it. Now, everybody doesn't. It's, sure. Yeah, that's no, that's why no, I love Napa Valley. But yeah, there's no necessarily right or wrong answer. to. I look at Bordeaux for Bordeaux Reds and they, they have a pretty good head start on us. I mean, it's got a little experience. I, I mean, I love races when you're spotted 200 years. I mean, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> They're always going to win. You know, they're always going to win. Trust me. So. so next question. Lots of questions. Um, where do you think 14 fits in with 12 and 13 in terms of aging and structure? Um, that's from Isaac Baker. He says this seems almost right in the middle to him. Isaac, uh, so Isaac Baker, who's been with us for um, a number of our sessions and always asks really good questions. Mr. Thank, Baker. thank you, Isaac. Yeah. Um, so the question was a vintage question. How does 14 kind of stack up relative to 12 and 13? Because we have a sequence of really killer vintages starting with 12. So 12, 13, 14 three amazing vintages back to back to back. I would say that the drought has some uh, uh, influence mm -hmm. on why we've had three amazing vintages back to back to back. But Tony, how would you stack up 14 uh, relative to the other two? 13, 14, 12. There you go, done. Let's go to the next question. No, just joking. Let's go have a martini. Uh, we're done, this is easy. No, I think four, 12 for me was coming out of 11s and I still thought there was, we made some great wine. I, I love the 12 blue line, and but yet, 13 and 14 were superlative vintages. They really, truly were for me. And then 15, we got a little weird again, but yeah, I love the wines. It turned I mean, out pretty good. Yeah, it was I, mean, one maker I, I went to a tasting today, obviously. So let's, let's and, talk uh, a little bit about the specifics of each one of the three vintages. So 2012 vintage coming off the heels of a very cool, very wet vintage in 2011. A lot of people thought that vintage was a warm vintage when in fact it really wasn't. It was a very moderate vintage, um, but the growing degree day concentration looked a lot more like 2005, maybe 2001. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a warmer vintage than 2011, but still relatively cool when you stack it all up. 2013 and 2014 were warmer vintages. 13. Oh, <laughs> but no, in so, reality. So I mean, the, talk about the magic of 13. Well, 13 with the magic nice. is, and see, all of you out there, we, we've heard California get, you know, we always get slapped. I mean, I always like to say the B word before that, you know, because all of the vintages are the same. It's not. I mean, come, in, sp come spend a harvest here, and you'll see it's not. And the reality is I've grown up here. I grew up in the Bay Area. The fog is everything. And in yeah. 13, we had hot days, cold nights, the diurnals. Yeah, a really a 40, big diurnal swing. People don't understand until you've been here. I mean, look at the back of my truck by the end of the harvest. I have 34 sweatshirts back there because, you know, you're up at 4 a.m. wearing a sweatshirt. By 11 p.m., you're throwing the sweatshirt in the back of the truck. And then the next day, you go to, you get up in the morning, where's my sweatshirt? I'll grab another one. <laughs> and so the reality of it is, is that you have a 45 degree swing. And we had that in 13, that hot to cold. I always joke and told Jeff, it's like putting the fruit in a refrigerator at night. You know, you know, you put your cheese plate and fruit out, and then when people go home, you put it back in the refrigerator to make it last. Well, that's what we're doing in yeah. 13. Mother Nature does that for us here. So really high tannin concentration and really color. high color Color's off the chart. Color. I, mean, I remember Jeff came on the crush pad. We were crushing. I'm just looking, I'm like, 
I didn't do this. <laughs> I want the credit. But I, I didn't do this. Mother Nature did this. And we have those vintages. You have Mother Nature vintages. You have wine making vintages. So 12, not quite as high uh, phenolic mass. But maybe some a little, place, a little some higher places they acids. were. 12 was a very much pocketed. We're only talking about us. Yeah, Screw well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, no. 13 is, I mean, you know, Robert Parker came out, you know, all of you out there, like Robert Parker. Ooh. Er. But he said, I mean, he's tasted more wines than probably all of us and said it's the best vintage he's ever tasted in 50 years. Yeah. Or however long he's been here in Napa. And he's right. Unfortunately, I'm like, Bob's right. You know, it's just so, it's unbelievable. So the 14, so if, if we could kind of distill it down, certainly for the hourglass perspective, 2012 was a little bit more of an acid-driven um, vintage, maybe a little lower phenolics, and uh, a lot of red fruit, tanginess, uh, very high, yeah. high, high-toned aromatics in that vintage. 13 was, was more, was a massive tan and color vintage, so much more mouthfeel, much darker fruits. Maybe slightly more muted aromatics, although the aromatics are pretty awesome. They're just a different type of aromatic. And then 14, I think, slides kind of right in between those two. Yeah, I mean, I think 13, I mean, you and I will argue until the day we die. When, when the camera goes off, we'll wrestle. I mean, <laughs> so it'll be amazing. I, I, I'm a really big fan of 12. But, yeah, so I'm a big um, fan of 13. So, I but, mean, but Tony's more of a palate impression uh, yeah. guy, and I'm a little bit more of an aromatics guy. So that would be consistent with yeah, those two. Yeah, it is. And I like vintage. unctuousness, and he likes aromatics. And that's funny, today I was... I told somebody at a tasting I was at earlier for another, another, another you know, my wine. Yeah, I make a little bit of wine, and, and really I said, I, wine, I, I said "What's I, the name of it?" A Patria. But I said, "I want my, I want your aromatics." Seek my, it out. Yeah, really, I want really, your, really and good. I told the person, I said, "I want your aromatics with my mouthfeel." <laughs> so we had the same discussion we just had. I tend to give a little aromatics to get mouthfeel. I love that sort of tactile sort of. I think it's almost with mouthfeel. It's almost sexual. It's just as sexy. I, mean, I love I love mouthfeel. So. I'm going to leave that one alone. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I do. Sorry, guys. I'm just being honest. I love density and richness and just opulence So in the mouth. So, so. next question. And we, yeah, before we move on to the Malbec, um, we've got a question. A couple of questions um, from Jeff Kralik. Um, he wants to know... Um, from Jeff Kralik. From Jeff Kralik. With the moderate increase in rain, how is the 2016 vintage Shaping likely up. to be different? So increase in rain. We had a normal rain year. The question is... With a little bit more rain, how is that affecting the 2016? It's never rain. Run? It's never rain. It's always the web that you have with it. And right now, I was talking to Phil Couturier today, and I was talking to Kelly Marr today. Yeah. We look good. We look great. Fruit set. Fruit set's everything. And that's what I worry about. Jeff and I were talking about yeah. it. Well, I do think, I do think that... Um, so when the, when the rain events happen, I think, is actually quite important. So if you have earlier rains and drier spring, you can have an enormous amount of rain as long as you're not having it in the springtime. In fruit set. During, during, well, <laughs> during flowering. The flowering is always... So during flowering yeah. is really important, but also the plant's taking its vegetative hormonal cues off of what's going on in the soil. So temperature, available moisture, available minerality, available nutrients, all of that stuff is setting the plant in motion to do something. So if you give that plant everything that it wants in in the springtime, then it's going to push into its vegetative cycle, mm-hmm. and it's going to begin to ignore its reproductive cycle, and the berries will size up accordingly. So the truly great winemaking sites, or vineyard sites, I should say, generally have a drainage component, a rock yeah. component Absolutely. of some kind, no, so that absolutely. they can simulate springtime water deficits. Well, and that's funny because, you know, you, you've all heard out there, we need dry farm in Napa. So I'm just going to hit all the, you know. All, Bang all, it. I'm going to kill them all. Bang it. It's a bunch of BS. I mean, it's true. It depends on the site. Well, no. It, yeah, yeah, it yeah. does. Well, it does. But yet in Napa Valley in general. Well, if you're down on the valley floor with really deep, yeah. rich soils, you you want well, to dry sure, farm. Sure, sure. But, but if you have a site like ours, you just say you just randomly say you randomly say I'm on a dry farm. No, there's no prescription, and I mean, if you're going to make truly world class wine, Burgundy gets eight gallons per vine per month. Well, and that may and be so that may be perfect but my point for is, those sites. Yeah, but my point is that they get that, but yet they're asking us, but they don't have irrigation. Remember that that's rain that comes down and falls on it. Right. So, so for us, I mean, <laughs> the 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 question of to water or not water is actually a really important question and water just enough what well that's it you get the water just enough the question is then when and how and where so that yeah. matters if you control the water you control the vine if you control the vine you, tr- you could control, control quality water. yeah exactly so so to do that sites that drain really well in the spring are really important because if you have a site that's not going to drain then you don't have control over that 
you, if you have the ability to deliver water, which we do in California through drip irrigation, we can make up for water deficits assuming we have it. So the great sites here tend to be the well-drained sites. And then we're mm -hmm. learning an enormous amount about water delivery and when we deliver water and when we don't deliver water. We generally, Tony, I think this is true, we don't do any watering up until Verasion. We are... And then after Verasion, yeah, we barely water. We flip I the mean, script. that's the funny thing is then, you know, everybody says, oh, no, not everybody waters there. I get frustrated at times because we're comparing ourselves to other areas in the world that are completely different. Right, have no... We are literally, you know, southern Italy. If you, was it Italy or Spain? I always we are that. literally... Napa Valley. No, no, but if you look at longitudinally, or latitude, I always get this correct. But Spain just okayed irrigation. Yeah. Smart. On the southern part. But, but I mean, you, then you compare to Bordeaux, if you if you break down the, the water they get per month on rain, it's, it's eight to nine. But it's out. also more than just the rain in Bordeaux. It has to do with relative humidity. Oh, so sure. Absolutely. You walk around, all of that. you spend any time in Bordeaux. The point in is, summer, is that, is that it's you, very you can't and compare green. the two. And, and they, people want to. It's a sound bite. All you got, everybody gets excited in the press. But you can, dis, you can basically destroy it very quickly saying, hey, let's I do think, math. I think the message here is that if you are using any sort of prescription farming methodology, you're screwed. Right. You have to just get in and understand your specific site and what it wants to do and then react to that. And we're incredibly, I mean, we are incredibly good with water. We're basically, you know, we're one step away <clears throat> from organics. So, it, shall we move on to yeah. Malbec? So, quick time check. We've got yes. about 20 minutes left. 20 minutes, guys. Well, you guys, 20 minutes? Come on. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> so, um, so let's, let's move on now to Malbec. I can listen to this little talk. Oh. It's amazing. <laughs> so, um, Malbec is not something that we set out to uh, put in a bottle, uh, not in terms of a, a varietal wine, at least. We set out to do Malbec as a blending component. Um, it generates an enormous amount of color and is a great bonding agent. Very soft. Very soft. It helps us in a lot of different ways with structure and with building layers and so forth. So that's why it was planted. When we um, took the first um, fruit from the Malbec, uh, which was 2010, I believe, yep. it was our first vintage. So we bought, we bought Blue Line in 2006. And then we pulled out about half of the vineyard, replanted it, and by 2010, the Malbec was, was online. And um, we were so blown away by how cool that wine was, and it was very different than anything else in the cellar. It had a, a little bit of a stripe of red fruits to go along with the blacks. Um, it had this really tangy minerality on the back mid palate. It was a little lighter, almost, um, I'm not going to say, it's not Pinot Noir-like, but it's not Cabernet-like either in terms of weight and mass. It's like Merlot with like some fat. Is yeah, what I always call and, it. and Zim. So, yeah, it is. Oh, <laughs> this stuff smells like Zinfandel. Yeah. It does. Zinfandel is about 20% Petitra on it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's got a real, it's got a real... Who would do that? <laughs> who, would, who would desecrate Zinfandel <laughs> like that? Oh, sorry, the Italians <laughs> would. It's not my bad. So, um, any questions about, uh, about the Malbec? Um, there's some questions about the varietal makeup. Apparently, the tech sheet says it's 80% Malbec, 20% Cabernet. Um, the website says Petit Verdot. It is not Petit Verdot, it's Cabernet. We have a, we have a little uh, communication miscue. <laughs> you know what? We're going to have a completely new website in about a month. No, so I can tell you. It's we're not, just I would shoot, not put shoot the old I can place. tell you why I wouldn't put Petit Verdot in there. It just, it just doesn't work. It, yeah, it would overpower it. So this yeah. is Cabernet in there. So. Yeah. So well, I would get his clone four too. So, so Cabernet and, and Malbec. What was the percentage? 80-20. 80-20. So it's basically four barrels of, of Malbec and one barrel of clone four. That's what I and, guess. And that, that cab's going to give you a little bit more structure to it? Yeah, Petit Verdot was just too massive for this wine. I didn't want to put it in there. I mean, 20% Petit Verdot in anything would make it just like Petit Verdot. So right. that's why I know it wouldn't be Petit Verdot. Um, Cabernet's okay, Petit Verdot. Any wine I make, for the most part, uh, Jeff and I would talk about it and we would fight about it. You know, Jeff gives me a lot of leash and I hang myself every once in a while. <laughs> but the reality is, you can't go more than 9 or 10% with Petit Verdot without it tasting like Petit Verdot. It's just Petit Verdot it, tends it, to... If you put Petit Verdot in a blend, it'll grow in the Oh, it will. Too, it yeah. will. It will overwhelm you. So that's why I know it's not Petit Verdot. We tried them. Before you came on board, we tried to do a varietal Petit Verdot just because it was kind of fun and it tasted great out of barrel and we thought, oh wow, this is really cool. We had no yeah. experience with it. 
And so we bottled up some that was 80% Petit Verdot and 20% Cab. And at the time that we put it in the bottle, it was like, wow, this is so tasty. Tastes like really soggy water. Oh my God, about six months later, it was undrinkable. I oh mean, no, it, was just like, it, it, it literally was tastes like sausage it water. It's just so unusual. It's and, just and kind of funky, gamey, weird. Yeah, so I agree. Angular. So that's why I know it's not. So, so we've got a comment and a question. Um, Kim Johnson says, in her humble opinion, there are only a couple of winemakers in Napa Valley that can do a Napa Valley Malbec justice. You guys just got added to the list. Woo. And then Isaac Baker wants to know, um, why don't more Napa producers bottle Malbec? So, um, I, I don't know if you guys could, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys can hear Alex call yeah. this stuff out. Okay, <laughs> so we're, we're just going to go on the premise that, that you can, and if you can't, just uh, let Let's us know. We'll start making stuff up. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Amazing. So, um, so thank you for the, the kudos on um, being added to, uh, to some of the better uh, Malbec producers out there. That's really cool. Um, short list. <laughs> it's a short, it is. it is a very short list. That is. <laughs> but the reality is, it's a wonderful variety to drink and enjoy. It's really I mean, fun. I love this. I drink, it's yeah. great food wine. I do. I drink the hell out of this yeah. at home. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so then the, the I'm sorry, Alex. The second question had to do with why do you think more Napa producers don't bottle Malbec? Why? Okay. Um, Not a lot of it's planted. Uh, yeah. You want to read the question? No. I, I can they hear us, Alex? They can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> can they hear you? No, they can hear me. Yeah. Okay, good. I don't think a lot of it's planted. I think, I think it actually is economics at the end of the that day. That too, but I don't think a lot of it's planted. So Truthfully, there isn't there isn't yeah, much I mean, planted. So. And so the the question is why um, why take um, why take really precious dirt that you can plant Cabernet yeah. and uh, and plant it to Malbec to do varietal Malbec because the varietal Malbec category. I mean, you're, so, you're going to compete against a twenty dollar <clears throat> bottle of wine from Argentina, right? So. And it's really good, and uh, and so we our Malbec is seventy five, our Cabernets are one twenty five to two twenty two twenty five, and a chunk of the, and almost all the Malbec goes to the Cabernet, right? So the so. Malbec, I mean, this is just pure <laughs> economics. We have one acre of Malbec, so that Malbec, um, most of that Malbec goes into the Cabernet blends, and so from an economic standpoint, it lands in a higher price point. We love this so much. We thought it was really cool that we decided, well, let's just do something fun predominantly for our mailing list. And so we don't really market a Malbec unless you're on the mailing list. And we do 75 cases of this, so it's really teeny production. But we, we, thought, it, it, we thought it was just cool. And we thought that, you know, okay, so we won't price it at 150 bucks because we can't get that for it. And it is what it is. So... I think that's why more people don't do not do varietal Malbec. Okay, here we Jeff go. Jeff Kralik wants to know, Jeff and Tony, what's the biggest argument you guys have had? Slayer or... A slayer or Dokken. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's funny. We go back and forth. I mean, Jeff, I would honestly say the argument we have always the time is, is other than Slayer and Dokken... <laughs> I like them both. I mean, it's amazing. Dead skin mask. Hair metal's coming back. Dead skin mask be... is what I go to sleep to. So it's good. It's good. So it's fine. But And Dawkins, oh, George Lynch, his soul is oh. amazing. <laughs> but the reality is, Jeff and I go back for, it's totally, and I love you to death. Oh. It's marketing versus me. It's just different versus better. Different versus better. Yeah, okay. That's the argument. You and I had many nights over very yeah. drunk throwing yeah. things out napkins, yeah, cause I'm candle always, holders. I'm always, I think a candle holder does the face better than he does. I mean, <laughs> it's a pretty face. I don't have the face like he does. You know, so I, I, go to, I go lower. I, I can't wrestle I go like low, he does. I go lower. I go lower. I don't want to hurt that face. That's, that's the face of the brand. <laughs> so, but no, it's it's definitely, you know, we always argue. And we both go agree. It's different. I think sometimes people get confused with different. Yeah, and, not better. and it's actually it's, it's actually a good we have a we have a really good rapport back and forth. We we do come at things from a different perspective, and we will challenge each other in a really creative way. The, but there's also yeah. this sort of foundation of mutual respect. Absolutely. That, that the funny thing is, yeah, we drink the same wines. He'll or he'll get a wine list and a dinner. Like we'll be at uh, we'll, we'll we'll be at uh, uh, GT Oyster in Chicago, and is it GT? I think it is. Yeah. And, and he, we ate the same food. It's funny. I didn't even talk about it the other day. I looked at him like, you're eating the same food. And he exact ordered the same, same wine that I would have ordered. I'm like, okay, okay. We might have been born from the same family. But yet, I'm going <laughs> to yell at you later. I'm going to yell at you later just because I want to make sure you know. And actually, that, yeah. was one of the, that was one of the thought processes yeah. relative to hiring Tony yeah. was our palates tend to be sort of 
very articulated very similarly. And I didn't, when we made this shift, I didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I wanted to just evolve what yeah. we had already started. I mean, Bob taught and I respect us a Bob lot of amazing death. I mean, things. Bob's a legend. I mean, for me, I mean. That's unbelievable. Yeah, and, would, yeah. and so we wanted to take the platform that he had started and then just continue to evolve it sort of to the next level. So um, to do that, you have to have, um, I think, I think the owner, the winemaker, the the vineyard management team, the seller guys, we all need to have sort of a um, a similar set of objectives, yeah. and we need to have a similar articulation to our palates to sort of get there. Now, within that, we do push each other. So, yeah. as I said earlier, Tony's more of a palate impression guy. I'm a little bit more of an aromatics guy, and those things can cancel each other out. So. That's I, bullshit. Uh, I love. <laughs> just give me time. It's true. It's kind of true. But I just want to give more time. <laughs> Um, so, okay, you, shall we start our biggest argument ever? Right <laughs> we are, yeah, really. You want to see it? It's coming right now. It's coming. And it's FYI, coming. there's been overwhelming support in favor of Slayer. Yeah. Oh, Slayer? Slayer, really? yes. Okay. All right. Who doesn't love Slayer, dude? Come on. <laughs> don't, don't discount Dokken, though. Yeah, don't, don't be, discount Don't be a hater. Him. Don't be a hater. Were, one one Dokken wrote. That's my bro. Okay. I love that guy. George Lynch. What a, what a, what a. So. <laughs> I can make you know, the problem is in the end any argument I'll make him laugh in five seconds. It's something I'll do, but no, oh no. It's just the truth of the matter is we love what we do, and I'm incredibly passionate about what I do, and I'll fight to the death, blood fight maybe, you know, chains. Um, but we always find a workaround. I mean, we we've always, never fought. We've we, never no, fought. Not really, no, not even. We all understand what we're trying to achieve, and and we may, I, I we drink the same wines you drink. We so may have I mean, some minor disagreements here and there, but we really, it's it's about trying to find your it's way. It's about through. personnel, usually. But no, it's about money. No, <laughs> you know, it's always five reasons. Yeah. Well, same, same thing about my life, you know? yeah, exactly. If you would, five reasons, it's the yeah. shoes, Tony. It's it all is. about those goddamn shoes you, know, you keep buying. You, I cannot Manolo Blahnik. Manolo Blahnik. You know, well, I can't ever say it, but but you know, work boots. You know, they're amazing. You should, you you should see, see my soles. My my soles are red. You no, should, I just see tender of product, product, product. Like I have the calves for them, so it's good. So. <laughs> all right, HG three, HG three. Do we have to get serious like, again? Is, Alex, right. is this falling apart? It is falling yeah. apart. You know what? I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it down. That's what I do. All right. So we have to get real serious again. HG three. Okay. So HG three uh, came about as a function of some of the changes that we referenced earlier relative to our blending protocol. So as I as I mentioned. Tony, uh, excuse me, we used to blend under Bob sort of very late in the cycle, right before bottling and so forth. Now Tony likes to blend earlier, um, right after malolactic fermentation. And Tony is also sort of this idea of, of winding more energy intentional edge into the wines. Another thing that Tony will do is do more sequential picking. So we'll take the same block that maybe we would pick on the same day, maybe a little later in the cycle. We'll take that block and we'll chop it up into a couple of different picks so we can get Earlier picks have more acidity, more red fruit, more tangy minerality. Later picks that give you more unctuousness and black fruit and, and mouthfeel and so forth. And so, you know, in the past we might make three different Cabernets from Blue Line. Uh, now we're making, what, 20, 17, 18? It depends I would on the say year. off the property, we'd probably do 15 picks. So yeah. 15 to 18, depending on the vintage. If it was a colder vintage, we'd probably do 20 to 24. So. so then, so we're winding this together right after malolactic fermentation, and there's some lots that are just very obviously going to want to go together, and they create the core okay. of the blend. And then there are other lots we're trying to evaluate: do they go in? Do they not go in? And evaluate them over we call them time. Grumpy. They're grumpy, grumpy lots. The out, the outlaw, the grumpy outliers. Yeah. So those lots we will evaluate over the course of time, and if Tony decides that one lot is ready to go in, then it'll go in. If not, then we 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 decide. I mean, you and I are tasting yeah. everything together. I mean, so yeah, I mean, if I believe in it, and I really get upset. Yeah, maybe that's the case. But I mean, it's a team effort. It's always a team effort. We even had our, our old assistant winemaker Justin involved yeah. too. So yeah, we try to get we and, try to get everybody in the cellar involved in taking some ownership in in the winemaking. And I, I and in the end, I mean. In the end, it does fall on me and Jeff. So if I really truly believe it's going to be a, a problem, I'll go toe to toe with Jeff. But we'll probably do it at his house, just the two of us, you know, <laughs> over a bottle of '69 Madavi, and that's always makes it easier. That you know, makes it makes a lot it easier. easier. Jeff and I love old California Cab, so we drink a lot of it. So so get, so softer. so HG3 now um, is a new project from us that came about through some of these changes. So we now have more lots to choose from. To assemble the blends, the blends are now coming together earlier. So the outgrowth of that is that we've had some tail ends that are still very high quality wines, 
but didn't make the final um, core blends that yeah. would be bottled under the varietal uh, they're releases. Not, they're not a hundred dollar bottle of wine, they're fifty dollar right. bottle of wine. And, and That's correct, awesome. correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it has a lot to do with sort of the structural uh, integrity, so the tannin, you know, and, yeah. and how... Sometimes how, yes, sometimes no. I mean, I think you and I both know that a lot of times it's that way, but sometimes I think there are wines that just don't fit. Right. They're, not, they're not big enough, they're not sweet enough, they're not... Yeah, for whatever yeah, reason. They're they, just not there. They push they, the blend in a direction and, and they don't want it to go. you hit a vein in the vineyard that just wasn't there. I mean, yeah. it happens at times, and and that gives us the opportunity now to, to, to make our Blue Line Cabernet, which we'll try in the fall, right. better. But yet, this wine at, at the price point is is smoking. At the you know, the yeah. wine is so great, and we're still we're still crafting it. So so it's it's declassified uh, Blue Line Estate fruit and contract fruit that we go out and acquire and yeah. and make. Um, Jeff Kralik would like to know. He says it sounds more labor intensive. How is it less expensive? It's uh, it's not. It's it's actually <laughs> it, the labor is now yeah it's 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 more expensive. So that that's a decision that we made based on trying to improve the quality of the wines over time. And, yeah. you know, we feel that that's really important. Well, I mean, you know, Blue Line Cabernet is a higher price point, so maybe you eat a little bit of margin there, or even cost there for this. I mean, it just, we want Blue Line Cabernet and Estate Cabernet, whatever we do, to be the best thing. It, I, I, I will not even, for a second, sacrifice quality for those wines. Yeah, and I think, I think one, of the, one of the, the first things that Tony wanted to do in coming on board is to really wrap his arms around the Blue Line Estate. I did. That property yeah, is, is um, has enormous potential, and I'm not sure that we had reached it then, and we're still no, tweaking with it. No, no, I mean, um, I started in 12, and, you know, it's only my fifth vintage there, and I just told Jeff the other day, you know, I kind of made some mistakes, you know. here's I now see the property. I mean, when I was at Plump Jack, it took me three or four years to understand the property. It's taken me three or four years to understand this property. Yeah, and it may take it may take longer than that to truly, you know, sort of dial off. Yeah, no, no. I think the 337 and the other blocks, I, I absolutely. But the 4, the clone 4, which I think should be the backbone of Blue Line. That's always been a, yeah. a challenge block there. But, but I think it should be the best. I, I really believe in that block. So, it, see, it, we're fighting right now. This is what happens. <laughs> We're going to crack a bottle of Ravenna Chablis in about an hour, and we're going to figure it out. So that's what we do. So, <laughs> so, um, so HG3 then um, is this uh, opportunity for us to declassify some wines and still be able to um, cover our costs in those instead of bulking it out where we would kind of lose our shirts. There's no margin. Uh, there's no margin in, in bulking wine out. So um, the other thing that we find that's kind of cool about this is that when you make 3,500 cases of estate wine, <clears throat> that are priced in our price class, a lot of people don't have access, can't afford, but would like to. And so HG3 becomes an, an opportunity for us to be able to get a little bit more wine out in a little more people's hands. It's a little more accessible and they can experience kind of some of what we're doing. And, uh, you know, at some point they may kind of stair step their way up to the rest of our program. And, and so it's a, it's a neat little addition to the portfolio. Okay, and with just a couple of minutes left, um, I wanted to save this great question from Steve McIntosh for last. He says, this is the fourth vintage of these wines that he's tasted. These years trend from austerity in 2011 to restraint in 2012 to balance richness in 2013, and finally approachable powerhouses in 2014. If you had to pick just one principal reason for the trend, would it be climate, cellar, or other? Hmm. Hmm. Hmm, <laughs> hmm, we huddle. <laughs> Damn, one. We have, to, um, we have to distill it down to one thing. I think you know it's a great that's, question. That's I a mean, great question. <laughs> you know, from a winemaker standpoint, I finished the elevens for 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 Bob, and I think that um, that that vintage you couldn't get off the mark of that vintage. That vintage marked Napa. The vintage had a strong yeah imprint. You couldn't get away from it. You could you could yeah. And then I think from for you know for me as a winemaker you know it's hard you come in as a winemaker and you're replacing a legend Bob Foley's a legend I did it at Plump Jack with Nils Vengi, and you're trying to honor what they did in the past but but also take the take the winery maybe perhaps not in a different direction maybe put some new shoes and a paint job on the car you know new shoes meaning tires and Just evolve and refine yeah and evolve and refine and do the same thing at Plump Jack so twelve might be more that way thirteen I mean. I love that vintage. I mean, I can we can, we could brawl at her you know, on that wine, but 
I think those wines, you know, as much as you say re restrained, I mean, I think those wines are opulent too. I mean, but there is a restraint to them. It's funny you should say that. I never saw them that way, but they are. They are. But they're massive wines. I mean, if you look, uh, yeah, I, I won't get into it. I mean, I, I can't would, get into it, Jeff. Answer, I, can't, I, I, I can't go there. It hurts. It I hurts would too answer, bad. I would answer the question but, that um, each one of the wines that, that you described and the vintages that you described is characteristic of what the vintage provided for us. Yeah, absolutely. And that's... And, and so, you know, so the vintage does play a really strong role. Now, the th there is also a thread of consistency through those three different or four different vintages. Actually, in, in this case, it would be three different vintages because we, because Tony came on board in 2012. Yeah, 12, and th perfect. there is a little bit of a stylistic shift um, starting with, with, with yeah, Tony 12. coming on board. That thread that runs through there is is two things. One is the personality of the vineyard, which we have two vineyards that have really strong personalities and they want to show that personality. And then third piece of it is Tony's hand at um, taking those vintages and maximizing each one of those vintages and maximizing the best he can out of the vineyard for that. So it's really difficult to distill it down to one thing. I think it's those three things wound together, working um, sort of um, alongside each other. I, I'm not a believer in um, terroir for the sake of terroir, meaning I was asked um, uh, in a panel discussion some time ago, you know, does a vineyard have an ultimate expression of terroir? You hear this all the time. You hear winemakers talk about it. You hear wine writers write about it. A vineyard has sort of the ultimate expression, and, and our job is to find the ultimate expression of that vineyard. Well, it's quite possible that a vineyard might have several ultimate expressions. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, mean, I was talking today about C clone, our, <clears throat> our, our heritage clone that we grow in all of our properties. If you, maybe you grow Grenache on this property, you know, how would you know that Cabernet might grow better? Right. So, you know, and just... in addition to that, um, having different winemakers with slightly different stylistic goals is going to change the interpretation of that terroir. And there may be a multiple, a, a multiplicity of really killer or really bad options that could come from a vineyard site. So terroir, think, I think of terroir as a range of options that the vineyard will give you. And some vineyards yep. will give you a wide range, and some vineyards will give you a narrow range. They'll give some vineyards will give you no range. Or no range, exactly. <laughs> so so the, possi corn. the possibilities of, of the expression of that is sort of the range of, of options that you have. Now, it's the winemaking team's responsibility and job and so forth to try to pick a spot on that spectrum that they think can, can be a great expression of that. And... Our ability to do that is what we're trying to find out. But um, one guy might do it this way, and one might, guy might do it this way, and one consumer might like this one, and one consumer might like that one. So um, it's a it's a really hard question to answer, that, to distill it down into. Here's the consistent line. Yeah. Come on, Alex. <laughs> I think that's about it. We're getting lots of love for the HG three, but yeah, awesome. I think just some final. So um, we love doing these. It's really great um, to be able to connect with you guys. We would like to encourage you if you have the opportunity to come out and put boots on the ground and hang out with us. Um, we'd love to take as much time to geek out as you guys will, will allow us. So if you're interested in, you know, sort of a deeper look at this, I can't, I can't um, encourage you enough to come out to the vineyard and hang with Tony and hang with me or whoever's, uh, whoever's around the property at any one time. <laughs> hang out with me. That could be a little sketchy. Uh, it's, it's a rough day. <laughs> it's a rough day. It's a rough day. <laughs> you won't be happy. Just bring your boom box. That's all exactly. I have to say. And a little slayer. Sure, it's a little slayer. <laughs> Lots of slayer. A little slayer goes a long way. So any other questions, Alex? I think that's it. Come on, guys. Really? Um, yeah. No, awesome. uh, uh, Jenna Francisco, last question, wants to know if you guys are open to the public or by appointment only. We are by appointment only, um, but we do try to accommodate as many people as we can uh, along the way. So um, come visit us. All right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for taking the time. Yeah. So.